Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Gambale. We have an incredible panel, panel here today for you. Um, you are on this webinar series all about recovering with resiliency. This is the third part of the series. And the whole series theme is about how to reposition your small business for success. Just to kind of review, um, we started off the series with how has marketing changed and how has rebranding changed during the pandemic. And we had some great presenters talk about how things have shifted and changed, mostly in the food and beverage sector. So if you missed that one, go to the YouTube channel, go to gambalilabs.com and check that one out. The last series we did was all about retail and how did the retail business owners within Louisville shift and change and do things differently day in, day out to get their businesses to this incredible position where they're not that far off from where they were last year. In fact, some numbers of theirs are just ahead and doing well. And that takes a lot of entrepreneurial thinking and shifting. Today is really about rebooting your finances, how to restructure them during these uncertain times to stay ahead of the the financial plan, which you probably tore up, shredded, and lit on fire um, multiple times this year. And today's presenter is going to really chat about, well, what are the things you need to be thinking and doing to get your finances back to a degree of certainty and control in your hands? And then in the last week, uh, we'll talk about some service businesses. What have they done? How are they pivoting? And so thanks for joining this series. Um, so we are super excited to have Megan Pierce, the Economic Vitality Director from, from the city of Louisville, be the primary sponsor for this incredible series. Uh, if you do need to reach out to Megan, her information's here. You've probably seen a ton of great emails from her about what's next, what's happening, what are the opportunities and resources. We get that this whole year of economic business cycles has been dynamic and, and she's just been awesome sharing the latest and greatest from uh, the city of Louisville's perspective. So we're super excited to have Megan. Uh, Megan, can you maybe give everyone a highlight on this great um, new program that you've been spearheading and what's going on there? Sure, and thank you for the opportunity today. Glad we're, glad we're back at a new day and time to share this information with our local businesses. So just briefly want to talk about the Recovery and Improvement Matching Grant Program. So the city just launched this program last week. We've been talking about it for a little while. It's a lot of the content of all those emails Mark mentioned that I promise are relevant to what you need on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but this is a great program. We have $150,000. Um, all businesses that are brick and mortar and licensed within the city of Louisville are eligible to apply. Um, so you can get 50% of a project up to $10,000 um, covered. You just need to talk about, you know, describe a project um, that is helping your business recover or improve, possibly change your operations. Maybe you've had to to think differently about the services you're providing, how your customers access your business. We'd like to help you with those projects to make sure that you're sustainable in the long run. So we have, um, we have a dedicated project website. I've included here also the direct link to the application. Um, and you know you can go through, take a look at the application, see what's required, um, and always reach out to me with any questions. And then on the next slide here, I want to also share uh, what what the state is doing. So um, I know a lot of people, and certainly Michael's going to speak to this today, we're dealing with PPP or idle loans. Um, the state of Colorado now has a group, it's a nonprofit arm called Energize Colorado, uh, that has $25 million that they're going to be doing in a combination of loans and grants. And these are for small businesses in Colorado. Uh, so limited if you have 25 full-time employees or less. They're also going to be giving preference to women-owned, minority-owned, veteran-owned businesses. So, you know, if you fall into one of those categories, it's definitely something you should look at because there's potential financing up to $35,000 by combining loans and grants. So I know the grants are certainly something people like to see more than the loans, but these are also um, exclusively low interest type loans. So if you do need more money, being able to get that combination, I think is advantageous. So there's a link here to their website. They also have a call center and an email um, link that you can follow to get questions answered about the program. I'm glad you mentioned this, Megan. 
Now, the program that you mentioned for Louisville, that is a first in, first out. So when you complete your application fully and send it in, then it gets reviewed. But Energize Colorado, is that a little different? Yeah, so because they're giving preference to certain types of businesses, it's not going to be as clear as first in, first out from, from what I understand because they do want to give preference to, you know, because it is all small businesses and then they're giving preference within that definition. I think it'll be a little more of an involved and back and forth review process. But correct, um, our grant program this round is, is a little different than the last one. You didn't all have to get in within a two or three day window. Um, I'm taking complete applications as they're received. If I get something that's incomplete, you don't, you don't go in the pile to get reviewed yet, but I reach out to you and let you know, hey, we're missing your W-9 or I need more information about your project. So usually I'm getting back to people in about a day so they know what they need to, to complete to be considered. Awesome. That's great. That's really helpful for everyone that's on the call today. Uh, and thanks for doing that and sharing that answer. Sure. So uh, Gambali Labs is super excited to be sponsoring this series. Uh, we did one back in the early spring, really focusing on um, recovering and really just resiliency and getting to a particular point. And now we're talking about regrowth. Uh, I'm the founder of Gambali Labs, and uh, Ellie is one of the key people on my team. Our focus really is resiliency and recovering with you in your business. We do that from a marketing perspective. We do that from a back-end operations perspective to connect those things together that bring you new leads and um, new revenue streams that you know you need to get to to shift and get through this tough process. A number of you out there in the city of Louisville have done a lot of innovative things and we've been excited to be actually partnering with you. And uh, this is just part of that educational series that we love to do to teach people, here's some new ways of doing things. Have you thought of this? And uh, Ellie is uh, just a great person on the team. Ellie, why don't you share a little bit about yourself? Hey there guys, so I'm Ellie, I'm part of the Bali Labs and I kind of operate as the digital art director. So basically I work with Mark and our other team member Wayne to kind of help bring kind of the branding and um, those aspects to life. So basically most of the front end visual design, we really wanna work with everybody to make sure that your brand is, has a really solid foundation for growth and for moving forward. And um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so as Ellie kind of said, there's just, so many things that might be something that you're thinking in the background, whether it's a business pivot, a new look, a new feel, something that puts you top of the radar for search for Google, getting you in touch with the right prospects via a digital ad campaign, or might could be some other new digital commerce things that you're trying to do. So if there's something that's digital and something that's pivoting and something that's bringing you new revenue streams, uh, we're all about that. And we're, Super excited to kind of partner with you and guide you along that way. And that's one of the things we just love to do is have that business relationship uh, going forwards with amazing um, business owners like you. So today uh, we're thrilled to have a Michael Fennessy. Uh, he's someone I've worked with uh, multiple times on different projects and he's worked with different clients that we have as well and help them manage their cash flow do applications and do mission critical things when they come up. So we're thrilled to have Michael. Uh, he is the founder of Synergy Business Advisors, a local Louisville business. In fact, um, I was in a coffee shop pre-COVID with Michael, uh, sitting next to him, didn't even know him. And this was back last year. And one of my clients said, I need an amazing financial person that can just get stuff done in a fast way that's not going to destroy what I'm trying to do and be this super expensive um, high-end CPA. And I just nudged the guy next to me. I said, hey, do you know anyone who's really good at finance and planning and all that stuff? And Michael's like, that's what I do. <laughs> so I connected them and connected with him with so many others. And it's just been great um, hearing him and how he's advising others through this really tough time. So, uh, Michael, why don't you take it away? Hi, thank you, Mark and Ellie and Megan, and i um, happy to be here today. And a little bit about myself. So, as Mark said, I'm the founder of Synergy Business Advisors, and we work with small businesses. And what we like to do is 
just clean up the business. Come in and look at the books, clean up the books, make sure that you're tracking everything that you do. And what that may do is uncover the hidden opportunities and create other efficiencies. And like Mark talked about before, is in this economy now, we, we may have to pivot. Are you able to pivot? So just allowing the business owner to be able to make better business decisions moving forward. So services, you know, or accounting, consulting, tax planning. Um, we're more on the accounting bookkeeping side and we do tax planning for our bookkeeping clients because we like to have an intimate knowledge of what you're doing. So our services allow you to focus on what you do best and that's grow your business, um, run your business in the day-to-day -day operations, and then we take over those tedious processes. So I'm really happy to be here um, today uh, to be part of this series and to help contribute and give back to the community. That's what excites me um, the most. So it's my hope today that you leave here with a few takeaways from this presentation and that helps your business move forward um, so you can continue to increase your customer base and then also um, maintain that competitive edge. So let's get into the topics of today and what we're talking about. And some of these may be sensitive topics, um, so we're going to keep it at a high level. We're not going to dive in um, to anything too deep because I'm not providing any tax advice today um, since each business is different and without specific knowledge um, about your firm, it'd be unsuitable for me to provide any recommendations to you. So please keep that in mind um, as we ask questions today. So topic number one, I've, obviously you can read these, so let's move on to topic number one and just dive in um, to cash flow. So let's take a look at the next um, slide. So cash flow, it measures the ability of your business to meet its short-term obligations, and then cash flow is the flow of funds in and out of your business. So if cash is not involved, so you take something in on accounts receivable, that's not a cash transaction, so that's not helping the lifeblood of your business. It's still out there and needs to um, come in and be converted to cash. So the most, most important thing is to track your cash flow, and you're looking at um, the operations side. So we could have financing activities, we could have debt activities, but those aren't going to contribute to the sustainability of your business. So it's what comes in from the actual sales and those operating activities. So by improving processes and making more strategic decisions, you'll make a positive impact on your cash flow. And the key for business owners is when you look at your cash flow is to minimize the time between when you have to pay someone and then when you receive that payment. So if we can minimize that gap, the, the smoother your cash flow is going to be and you're going to have more confidence in making your business decisions and that you're able to meet your short-term obligations. So you may have negative cash flow even though you made sales because again, you know, those sales were on account. So you didn't receive cash, you're unable to, to meet the like your payroll. That's the one of the hardest things for business owners right now is the ability to meet payroll. So if you're not managing your cash flows efficient, uh, efficiently, you may not have enough information to make um, informed decisions. So in terms of accounts receivable, but back, I'm sorry, Mark, can you back up? Um, looking at accounts receivable by shortening the sales cycle, um, you have more information to be able to make decisions because you have the cash on hand and you're, you're able to track your daily sales outstanding is what we want to look at. So in, by helping by tracking this, you help manage um, your cash flow. And the lower your daily sales outstanding, the better you're doing collecting your accounts receivable. So when you're trying to solve your cash flow problems, if you allow and extend other customers' credit, then you're taking on their cash flow issues as well. So you need to have um, credit policies in place, which would be in terms of um, payment terms, late fees, if you don't have those in writing, then business other customers are just gonna push you off and extend and extend. So what you wanna do is you wanna try and minimize that sales cycle. How to do that, you can automate your invoices. It's more efficient and allows you to invoice, invoice more frequently. 
data has shown that the more frequently that you invoice, the sooner you get paid. If I invoice monthly, it's gonna take longer. There's gonna be a lag. If I invoice weekly, they, businesses tend, or customers tend to pay you within 19 days. So that's one way by automating invoices, having the technology that when you send the invoice that you can, um, there's a pay now button right there and customers will hit that button and pay you sooner. So you have to look at your business. Are you able to take credit cards? Or is that 3% because you only invoice a few customers a month? It may not make sense to take that 3% hit on the transaction fees, but if I have lots of invoices and then those fees will, um, won't be such a, a big hit. On the account uh, payable side, so it's crucial, you know, a lot of business owners have the, I need to clear my, my desk mentality. A bill comes in, they pay the bill. So it makes sense to pay the bill when the pay when when it's due. So you can also negotiate with your suppliers. They may be able to provide discounts. So on this end of, of our accounts payable, it may make sense to look at discounts. If I receive a, a 3% discount, if I pay within 10 days, does that make a difference to my cash flows? Or should I wait until 30 days to actually make that payment to my supplier? So Looking at that, um, you know, should you take advantage of it? Are you paying interest because you put, you purchased, uh, you know, from your suppliers on credit, and then you were you took the funds from the revenue and you put that back into your business, or you put it towards payroll, and then is that you still have a balance sitting on that credit card? So managing credit cards um, is significant, and then also the rates, negotiating your rates is uh, another way to do it. And for cash flow as well, um, I think we can uh, go to the next slide, Mark. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. I'll just keep talking. Um, so knowing your margins. So um, the need to keep the direct costs, you know, you need to cover those direct costs for each job as well as your overhead. A lot of business owners just focus on the direct costs and they forget about the overhead that they need to cover as well. So if you know those costs, and then you can maybe um, possibly look at changing your pricing structure to become more competitive because you'll still have the profit margins. And then job costing will help you understand what products or services that you provide um, that you should prioritize in these times. So we have a wide array of services, but by prioritizing the ones with the highest profit margins, um, by, priori by prioritizing those, we can uh, bring in more revenue and then improve our cash flow as well. And then should you take on um, certain clients right now? Are you just trying to meet your expenses? Or, you know, should you stop taking on those clients that aren't as profitable as others and just focus on the more profitable ones during these times? So there's a lot of different ways to look at how to improve cash flow on the revenue side as well as uh, expenses. So I would recommend auditing your expenses. So does each expense that you have, you, you categorize it, does it uh, contribute to more revenue coming in? And does it also contribute to acquiring clients or maintaining your current clients? So that's uh, important as well. And then the timing for cash flow, the timing of, of payments. So when my payroll is due, when I receive payment from my clients, or when I have to make payments to suppliers, if I can shift those, if I can tighten them or, or uh, lengthen that process, the whole business cycle, uh, the sales cycle, um, I can shift and, and even out my payroll. So if I pay my, pay my employees two times a week, I'm not gonna have, or uh, excuse me, uh, every other week, I'm not going to have an even um, uh, payroll cost per month. So I'm going to have two months that I'm going to have three weeks of payroll. That's going to throw off my cash flow. And then I'm going to be underestimating in the other 10 months or other, other months, excuse me. So by shifting to going bi-monthly um, or bi-weekly, excuse me, uh, the strategies will smooth out that payroll and those expenses. 
Okay, next um, slide, Mark. So as an auditor, I found it very frustrating um, when I would audit a business and they would mix their business and personal finances. And this could be detrimental to a, a business um, because it's hard to track what costs are personal and which one are business related. So there's a lot of lost time for business owners as they're sorting through receipts, trying to find the deductions when it comes to tax time. And when you think of the shoebox and all the receipts and they're sorting through, um, so you're not able to focus on the daily operations, you're focusing on, I need to get my receipts and my deductions and whatever expenses I have and trying to sort through them. And that can make it difficult when you're applying for a business loan. So when you're applying for a loan and they ask for documentation, they ask for you know, a tax return, that's when everything's sorted out, or they ask for your bank um, statements, it's gonna be blurry and an inaccurate snapshot of your business when they're looking at those bank statements. And it also, you're unable to um, forecast and make estimates moving forward. When I've got other expenses mixed in, I don't have grasp on my actual cash flow and making smart decisions will be um, difficult. As well, are you paying additional interest or fees? Um, you know, we talked about putting expenses on credit cards. Is it on a personal credit card? I forget that that's there, and then and when the revenue comes in, I put it back into the business. So you may be having additional costs, you know, carrying costs of that debt. And also, you may miss deductions if I lose the receipt or I'm, I'm scrolling through my bank statements. And sometimes those statements, those line items, there's not much detail there, and you may think it's a personal expense six months later and forget that that was actually like association dues or something. Um, so you may be missing deductions there. And ultimately, you don't know if you're paying too much in tax. So that could hurt you as well. Okay. Nice. And for the folks that are on today, as you have questions, if so, there's something that Michael says, just put uh, your question in the bottom part of the uh, panel uh, where it says Q&A or chat and just type that in there. Okay, moving forward. So a summary of for the cash flow is working towards building credit for your business. So credit just doesn't mean you know, FICO scores and, and the ability to get loans. It's also the credibility and the reputation in building your brand. So if I'm unable to pay a supplier, you know, when I go to work with another supplier because I've been dropped by one, is that phone call gonna be made from one supplier to another that can affect you moving forward. So you always wanna have a good reputation as well as good credit for your business. And as you build the credit for your business, you can separate between personal and business expenses and, it's, and it provides you um, that separation that you need. So utilizing a proper reporting system, so software, um, being able to track expenses, being able to track the income coming in, you know, allows you to make more informed decisions, automate processes, which help you save time, outsourcing um, certain tedious tasks that you don't want to do, um, bookkeeping, you know, many business owners are trying to do their bookkeeping at night, they're trying to do, um, do it on the weekend as well. And during this economic time frame. Like after this presentation today, I'm going to go be a first grade teacher for my, for my son for a little while. So all these trade-offs, when we look at the amount of time that we have to spend on our business, it's, it's just shrinking and trying to find that life work balance is, is hard as a business owner to begin with, never mind everything that we're going through now. So in implementing the cash flow uh, maximization strategies, which I talked about was the timing of your payments, your timing of your um, receiving payments from uh, customers, and then as well as other costs like payroll, which are significant, making those timings uh, match to maximize those strategies to get you through certain time frame. Okay, so this is the hot topic of 2020 is the um, PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, this is changing all the time. 
So guidance will come out. Um, you know, it's changed several times so far from early May all the way through August, and it's probably going to happen again. And I just wanted to touch on it briefly and kind of explain the process. As, as business owners, a lot of you have gotten these loans, you've been through the process, and it's the, the tracking of it, which is very important. So allowable deductions may be payroll and non-payroll. So I'm not gonna bore you with the details on those, but the most allowable deductions are forgivable. So examples of not being forgivable would be um, interest on debt obligations, um, would, would be one of those, um, and an al or allowable deductions that occur outside of the cover period. So there are certain deductions that are allowable, but not um, forgivable because they happen prior to, um, you know, if it happened in February, it's deductible, um, allowable, but not forgivable. So tracking those expenses are very, very important. So guidance has changed, as we said, um, in the future, it's, it can impact how those proceeds can be um, spent. So it's very important to track, um, have a system of tracking. So what we work with our, when we work with our clients, excuse me, uh, we, in, we, uh, uh, we, we call it tagging. So we tag those expenses. So I know exactly what can be applied to the PPP program. And then um, if changes need to be made, we can bring up the report, look at the payroll, what deductions were made, um, and then which ones are going to be allowable, forgivable, or which ones are, are no longer. So it's good to have a tracking system that way. So the main thing that I want to stress is that you should focus on using the proceeds on the cost, which qualify for forgiveness. So the major one is payroll. Um, but there are uh, restrictions on that, uh, certain deductions, certain amounts, um, I think we'll get into that on the next slide here. But there's a few questions that I have popped up. So what percentage of the loan must be applied to payroll costs? So 75% of the loan. Larger companies, tech companies, where um, there are um, significant payrolls, you know, up for each employee, it can be up to $100,000 plus other deductions can go on top of that. But as a guideline right now, it's 100000 for business owners, depending on your entity type and the income that you declared for your business and the wage that you took in 2019 impacts what you can take. So your employees are 100,000. You may be limited if you did the eight week period, you may be uh, limited, uh, limited to um, you know, around 15,000. Or if you did the 16 week, it may be 20,833. So, if you didn't take any income in 2019, that's gonna impact those numbers. So that's why I don't wanna dive into anything today because we don't know the specifics about um, your business. So what are the forgivable payroll costs? So we look at gross income um, and then other deductions. So the, the employer match for um, FICA like, and certain other um, expenses, uh, payroll expenses aren't deductible, but then the employer match for 401ks are deductible. So you need to be able to tag and then also um, to track these expenses to make sure that you're doing it correctly before you're going to submit your application for forgiveness. So you need to have that evidence to prove that you um, actually use the proceeds for allowable expenses or allowable deductions. So tracking those within your, your accounting software um, is, is major. It's probably the key takeaway from uh, for the PPP. Okay, um, uh, next slide, please. So internal controls, I wanted to touch on this because small businesses, this, this has a huge impact when it comes to fraud. Um, larger businesses, they can segregate duties of employees. They can have, um, but smaller businesses, uh, whether it's your bookkeeper or your, your employee, they're multitasking. 
they're doing um, the majority of the accounting. There's no way to segregate those duties. So safeguarding yourself against fraud and safeguarding your assets is priority number one. I have several times um, as an auditor for the state, I ran into situations where um, I alerted business owners about fraud committed by bookkeepers and um, employees. So struggling with those internal controls as a small business owner is you're limited and you don't have the time to dive in um, to the books and to be on top of every little transaction, but you have to put safeguards in place. And those safeguards may be just reviewing um, the bank reconciliations, making sure that those bank reconciliations are happening on a, uh, timely every, every month, reviewing the cleared checks, the actual copies of the checks. Um, I like to give one example of a business owner that I, that I met with and uh, he was happy to go through the audit process, um, but his bookkeeper wouldn't send us the documents that were required for the audit. She wouldn't get back to him. And he didn't know why they had a long standing relationship and, um, and she just wouldn't forward those documents. And he didn't understand why. And he's like, she does a great job. She only charges me $12 an hour. And as soon as he said $12 an hour, you know, I, I knew something was up. So the end of the story, she was only charging him, you know, a few thousand dollars, but she was forging checks. She was uh, altering checks and she was embezzling $30,000 a year for several years. And he had no idea because he, he gave her access to the bank account. So online, which is normal, you know, your bookkeeper, your accountant need access to that, but she also had access to the checkbook and other, um, so there was no segregation there of who had signature authority, um, you know, processes in place for larger expenses um, where the business owner should be able to authorize those transactions, she had carte blanche. So that's part of it is, is having some control over the operations when it comes to the accounting, even though you may not understand it, but just knowing enough or having someone else um, help you with that and oversee. So as I said before, the monthly uh, reconciliations, and then we also use uh, software that has an audit log. And this can happen you know, to, to detect fraud, and then it also can just be used on a day-to-day -day basis of what happened to the invoice from you know, Acme Incorporated, and then it shows up, Steve entered it, and then Steve deleted it accidentally on June 3rd at 10 a.m. So it just shows you what happens to those transactions, um, which is nice. Now moving forward, okay. And proper tax planning is essential um, for small businesses. So it begins with choosing the proper business structure. So just because you've been a sole proprietor for several years, it doesn't mean you can't restructure as an LLC and um, file as an S Corp for tax purposes. So this would depend on one, the business profits, and two, are you able to take a wage uh, that justifies that uh, change of entity type. So a lot of business owners, they think that purchasing bookkeeping software and they're using it, um, they feel like that's the sole answer, but the inputs into that software are, you know, what you put in is what you get out. And if you, the, as the saying goes, is what you don't know, you don't know. So if you don't have an accounting background, you're probably not going to set up the software and your chart of accounts um, correctly that allows you to track all these transactions. And this comes back even to the, to the cash flow. So as you see on the slide, um, overestimating leads to a loan to the IRS. And then you're giving the IRS a free loan of your funds and then you're losing that much needed cap, uh, losing the use of that much needed um, capital. And then on the flip side, you know, underestimating your taxes, you're gonna receive that 
unexpected bill from your CPA as soon as they're done with your, with your taxes that you owe. So there's the unexpected expense. And then there are also IRS penalties. So after that first year that you owe, the corresponding year, you're going to get penalized because you didn't have proper tax planning. And you may be missing out on deductions. You may be taking deductions that you don't qualify for. So you wanna make sure that you are properly tracking all your expenses, taking your proper deductions, and then that way you're maximizing so you know that you're not overpaying on your tax. And the important takeaway from the tax planning is just working with a professional that integrates your bookkeeping and your tax planning. I've seen it several times and it's the customer service and the ability of that tax professional to be able to help you make decisions moving forward. So when they are doing your bookkeeping and your taxes, they know if something's missing, they know um, what deductions to take because they have intimate knowledge of what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis. And then on the planning side, they can help you plan. Do you wanna take on more employees? Should you get a bigger warehouse space? Can you, can you take on those um, additional costs. So that way, you're just running everything more efficiently instead of one hand handing off to the other. Because with that tax preparer, when you hand the profit and loss, your last reconciled bank statement and your other documents, they're just gonna input and they're not gonna understand, they're only gonna understand what you gave them and not know if something's missing. So that's important as well. And that may lead to overpaying your taxes um, again. Next slide. So this is one that I, I like to bring up, I, I, and I made it number five. Um, I know a lot of people are, are thinking, not compliance, I don't want to hear about it. But, um, you know, I, all, I, I would like all of you to have a better understanding of how to limit your business's exposure to liability. You know, I was an auditor for the Department of Labor and I audited over a thousand businesses and I, I just keep seeing the same thing over and over. So I want to bring the awareness to how you can protect yourself because the, the hit that you can take is significant um, when you go through an audit and it is determined that your contractors are um, employees. So the first line item here is who's an independent contractor and employee. So most business owners think of the, the feds and the 1099 amount of 600. If I pay someone less than $600, I don't have to worry about it. Um, if they're doing the work um, somewhere remotely, somewhere else, which everybody's doing it remotely now. So that whole model has, has changed. Um, you know, they're an independent contractor. But the most important part is what, how does the, the state determine who's a contractor, who's an employee? And a con, they have a two-pronged test. So one, the contractor must be independent from direction and control. So I hire someone. Let's say I hire Ellie to build my website. Ellie knows how to build a website. I don't know how to build a website. I don't have any other employees that know how to build a website. So she's independent of direction and control other than the finished product as well as um, she's also customarily engaged. So she has multiple clients. To be a con an independent contractor, you have to meet both of those um, requirements, not one or the other. So a review of your business relationships may uncover exposure to those liabilities that you were unaware of, uh, unaware of even though you have a contract, 90% of the time those contracts don't meet. Um, the state uh, requirements because they're missing certain language. There's two lines that are never in there and that basically um, puts the burden of proof uh, on the business owner to prove that the workers are independent contractors. And uh, we have up here Uber, you know, Uber and, and Lyft just had to shut down their operations in California because they were, they, their contractors were deemed as employees at this time. So it's very important to, to look at those um, relationships. Always pay the contractors 
from their business name, not individuals. And also make sure, you know, have a review done, make sure that you have all your tax uh, reporting accounts opened. Uh, there are several companies that I've met with, they don't have workers' compensation, they don't, or they have an account and they're exempt for unemployment. Um, you know, sole proprietors are exempt, uh, but yet a lot of them have accounts because they don't know. Um, there's no training out there anymore. Uh, they used to go to the Department of Revenue and all the agencies would be there and they'd tell you exactly what you need to um, do to get your business running and that's all gone. So doing proper tax reporting, having the appropriate accounts, and then if you don't have those, when they assess, they may assess taxes, interest, and penalties. Even if you didn't have that account, they may assess penalties because you should have had that account for each quarter. So it's pretty steep. Um, so I just want you to be aware of that. Uh, next slide. So for the regulatory compliance, you know, find an expert to help you have a complete review of those relationships that may uncover the potential liabilities that are there. And it's, it's easy by having the proper contract, by compiling documentation to prove whether it's liability insurance, certain types of advertising, Colorado Secretary of State um, registrations, and then also, you know, a review of the reporting agencies to make sure that you're not overpaying taxes by having um, accounts that you should not have. And then the overall summary, um, the, the action items that you can take are work with an accountant and outsource those tedious tasks that you don't want to do. Clean up your books so that you have a clear understanding of the cash flow, how your business can move forward. Um, and by adopting those tools, you're going to save time. Right? Being able to track costs, being able to automate your invoicing, and plan ahead. So Q4 starts in 20 days. Um, so we're almost there, right around the corner for year end. So it's important to get moving now so that you're not, um, uh, you know, last minute trying to put everything together. Proper planning will help you, especially in this ec economic time of trying to smooth out that cash flow. And then this, by outsourcing those things and, and adopting um, those automated processes, you know, you can focus on what you do best and running your, your business um, and being successful. So thank you, everybody. So now I kind of want to open it up for questions um, sure. for folks that uh, are on today's live talk, as well as, you know, key things that have come up. So as you're listening in, and as you've heard things, Michael's gone through a ton of great content here that are great for uh, business owners that are trying to just deal with the day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month issues. One that I kind of had um, is of everything that you talked about, what do you think is like the most critical for business survival during these business times? I mean, these are huge things. Is it cash flow? Is it compliance? Or is it just literally just doing everything, all these five and making sure you're not missing one? So cash flow is probably the biggest because you have to be able to make decisions. Um, in this time, other businesses are going under. And if your supplier calls you, you know, as, as an example, and says, hey, I've got this inventory of uh, widgets, and I know that you, you buy these all the time. What if I sold you one year supply, 50% discount, you know, can you pay for it? You have to be able to make those decisions, and that's where cash flow comes into place. Um, and reviewing your expenses, you know, what is essential. Um, real estate, when we look at commercial real estate and office buildings, how many businesses, you know, small businesses are going to keep their employees remote. There's, we're already into this, you know, five, six months. Um, so there are going to be significant changes and understanding your cash flow allows you to make those business decisions to focus on one, the short term, we're all trying to get through this, but then long term, how do I improve my business and make it more efficient, more competitive? Nice. Thanks for that. Um, 
another one that kind of came in earlier is how how do you recommend people stay on top of the changes in PPP? Like, is there one source for that or is it largely just working with someone like you that deals with it day in and day out? Like, is there a magic place where all these answers are? It's, it's working with a professional that's on top of it, um, whether it is a tax attorney or a, a accountant or a CPA who you're working with, someone who has knowledge that stays on top of it. And the most important part is the tracking. So, so when it comes to being able to, or the time to apply for forgiveness, you have to be able to account for those expenses and make sure it was done correctly. And there's, a, there's been a couple of times where people what somebody bought a mansion, I forgot what they did up in North Dakota, um, just took the money out of the business and used it for their own purposes. So it's, you don't want to be, have it not clearly stated. Um, the process is going to be long um, and tedious probably because we are dealing with the federal government. So you, you want to make it simple, as simple as possible for yourself and not focus too much time because it can take a lot of time away from your business. So just working with a professional is, is what I would recommend. And Michael, uh, another one that um, I saw early on in, in the, uh, the beginning of the topic or the, the talk for you today is, um, I forget the name of the person, but how do you actually just go about picking a trusted oh, financial I account? I just lost you, Mark, I can't hear you. Oh. Oh, here we go. Okay. Oh, so sorry. Um, the question was, how do you find a trusted financial accountant to work with? So a lot of people ask, you know, other business owners, who do you work with? Um, it used to be someone would knock on your door. Um, it's just interview people. Find who you're, who you would like to work with, who can help you. Um, you know, know account their CPA is going to have every answer. So we work with a network of CPAs that you may need specialized um, experience and those expertise to actually create the tax return for you, never mind anything else. Um, so they're aware of those deductions. So interviewing, uh, inquiring, uh, just meeting with multiple people. Um, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in just partnerships. So I'm gonna work with one expert on one thing, um, and then they have, um, you know, work with someone else with other expertise and having a team. That's what you wanna do is you wanna build a team um, that can help you with those tedious tasks. And do it correctly. Okay. Megan, are there key questions that you've heard time and time again from business owners in the city of Louisville or just conversations you've had that um, you know would be good for, for this audience and those that are just trying to sort all this stuff out? Uh, may, maybe not as directly questions, but I think maybe points that relate to, to what's been shared so far. And I, I think this relates uh, first to the point you just, you spoke about that trusted financial advisor and how you get this information. I think one thing if, if you're doing those interviews and, and Michael, feel free to comment on this is, is to ask about how those people will proactively communicate with you. Because I think, I think a frustration I've heard is the business owners trying to outreach to get that information because they've heard or you know, they're concerned that you know, they're not following the process or there may be a change in the information is ask those financial advisors how they proactively communicate? You know, do they have regular newsletters that they send out with updated information? Or, you know, are they the type of person that will get on the phone and call you or send you a personal email and say, hey, I know you got PPP. This new guidance just came out. Here it is. Let me know if you have questions. So I think that would be um, an important point to incorporate into trying to find that, that trusted advisor based on our recent experience with these, uh, with these federal programs. Um, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And part of those um, issues that business owners are having is, are they receiving that comprehensive service? Are they actually having their, their accountant do their bookkeeping and have an understanding of their business? Because if I'm just calling my CPA who does my taxes, they're not going to worry about that until tax time or it's time to um, submit that application for forgiveness. 
Um, you know, right now it's, you know, they're working on the extended tax returns, um, the extensions for tax returns right now. So they're, they're short term focused of getting through that and then they may get back to their clients later. But yes, communication um, with your advisor and working with a team is important. I think that's a, it's an important point that you you may have been doing fine with your previous setup, but the current environment has has maybe provided an opportunity to say, I don't know if this relationship is working for me in the same way. If I'm really getting that comprehensive, you know, business financial advice that that I need, mm -hmm. and I think the corollary point I just wanted to to raise, if if Michael had any comments, and I think I think he spoke to this very well, is that. And Mark, maybe you'll recall from our first webinar series that we talked to people about putting things in place, you know, taking the time during the pandemic, which is very difficult, you know, based on all the ways people are pulled in different directions, but making an investment in the systems and in the tools uh, that, that will set you up for the future based on what we've been forced to learn in a very short period of time. So I think in the first series, we talked a little bit about it more related to, if you don't have a website, now is the time to invest in developing a website or, or hiring someone uh, that can assist you with that. And, and I think Michael's point is, you also need to do that. Maybe, maybe you'd been able to get by previously without having some of these detailed accounting practices or um, bookkeeping in place now might be a time that not only to protect you through through loan forgiveness but to set you up for future success yeah to that point megan sorry i don't mean to jump in um michael for you i know you briefly mentioned potentially people finding you or finding any kind of um, accountant type person through like word of mouth but is there any other database or resource i know we briefly kind of talked about quickbooks is there any other resource that you can kind of um, go to and look for for people <laughs> And so as you touched on, um, a lot of businesses use QuickBooks and there are certified, you know, me in particular as well, certified advisors through QuickBooks. Um, it helps you cut your costs. Number one, you can have the same service, um, use the same software, but your costs may be lower by working with a certified advisor. You're going to get better service from Intuit, number one, and the advisor, number two. Um, there's special benefits for that. So software is one thing, um, you know, to buy it, to use it, to know how to use it, you, you need to have an accounting background. Um, to find a CPA, um, I would, do they specialize in your area? You know, if I work, if I'm a CPA specializing in restaurants, um, I'm not going to know what to do with an auto dealership. I just remember there's one CPA in Boulder, it's all he does is auto dealerships. So it's finding the right match, finding someone who has the communication that you can work with. Um, and because it is a long term relationship um, that you're building. So as you know, as an advisor myself, I don't take on every client because the I I may not want to work with that client for some reason. There may be something that they're hinting at that I don't want to work the way that they want me to. Um, so it depends. So it's finding that relationship. It's give and take. Um, you know, CPAs, you can Google CPAs um, and, and see, but you don't want a CPA working all the time for you because those expenses are going to be higher. So having a team where a CPA can, from a network can be used, Let's say for the tax return, um, you don't have to be a CPA to, um, for uh, preparing taxes. So you have that higher cost, and then the rest of the time, you have your consultant getting paid a certain amount or charging a certain fee, and then you've got your bookkeeper charging a certain fee because a lot of CPAs will charge you all the time um, you know, a significant amount. So it's, it's just looking at the, the fit of the firm that you're going to work with or that team or network. Um, you know, is and it's part of it's word of mouth, part of it is Googling, part of it is um, who's local. I think that is significant as well. Um, someone I can reach out to, someone I can find, um, and it comes back to the communication and understanding your business, you know, intimate knowledge of your business. That's the one thing that I love 
from being an auditor is I got to sit down in front of over a thousand business owners and hear them brag about their business and learn about their industries. And then you take that knowledge somewhere else. Um, so it comes back to the CPA with only restaurant knowledge. They don't have the knowledge of construction. Um, so it's someone with a diverse background, I think, can help you, you um, kind of a jack of all trades, and then know when to seek other professionals. Sorry, that was long-winded. Yeah, but I think it's good, Michael, because it speaks to, you know, what is it that you're really looking for to help with your business? Someone that sort of gets it and understands it pretty quickly mm -hmm. and has the ability to say, in this type of business, here's the watch outs, here's the issues related to cash flow that if you tighten this up with a different policy, you'll do better and have um, stronger cash flow, stronger positive cash flow, or dealing with issues that are common in that sector. So it's asking those questions, searching for the right expert and making sure you can, can really work with them. And as a business owner, improve your business to kind of reduce your costs, reduce your compliance and risks, because that's what it's really all about, cost and risk and, and balance there. And, and I think part of that balance is it's, it's more than just tax planning. It's more than just bookkeeping. It's, you know, the social media side. It's, you know, how are you putting your business? Because people aren't leaving the house. They're searching more online. And how are you projected out there? Um, you know, what is your brand? And I think all the, all these pieces fit into it on, and, and how you're building your brand. And then are you efficiently, or are you able to make smarter business decisions to seize those opportunities um, that are going to be there that we haven't thought of as businesses pivot to, um, you know, adapt to this economy. We don't know how long it's going to be. Yeah, and, and to your point about financial costs before, looking at everything you're spending to say, is this revenue generating? Is it giving me a positive ROI from a sales and a marketing perspective and putting me in the best light to bring in the relationships that I want to be doing? Uh, and I think that's really critical for a lot of business owners. They might forget that marketing piece of, am I doing the right stuff and should I be doing it or should I have someone else handle these things and I do what I'm just best at? Amazing. So this um, has been a great talk. I love that you went into all these issues with so much detail and I know the detail behind it is even deeper. Michael, any closing thoughts for anyone uh, that's on today or that's going to listen to this online and watch it on our YouTube channel? I, I think with this pandemic, it, is, it has brought everybody together, um, you know, especially Louisville. I, I think we're all working together to, to improve and help each other downtown, especially um, to get through this. Um, I, um, but it's, it's time to reevaluate, as you just said, where your business is, where you want your business to go. How do I seize opportunities? How do I create efficiencies? So it's more than tax planning. It's more than just the cash flow because if you can uncover, you know, reduce your expenses because they don't add to the growth of your business by bringing in revenue or, or um, bringing in clients. How do you shift that to improve? And then what do you outsource right now as we're very um, cramped for time? you know, between the requirements of personal and business life, you know, how do you create more time? So maybe looking at outsourcing a portion, um, you know, to an expert that can help you and build your business. I think that's the, the biggest takeaway from today. Excellent. I want to thank Megan again for um, being our co-sponsor for this incredible series on uh, business resiliency and recovering in, in the city of Louisville, Colorado. And I want to thank you, Michael, for sharing your expertise. If anyone has a question for Megan uh, or for Michael, their contact information is in this talk. And definitely reach out because the questions you're asking now and the resources that you need might be the things that be the difference between a, a good fourth quarter and something that you're like, gosh, I don't know if I can recover from this. So thanks for uh, being part of this today. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.